what did it mean to you, Nebraska, and even just place in general? What did it mean to you before, before you read this book, and how did, did that change after? Wow, what a great question. I mean, before I wrote the book, um, my editor is yelling at me to show the map. Give me one second. I'm going to answer Marlon's question. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll do the map afterwards, editor. No, no, even though, yeah. So Nebraska was where my dad was, 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 um, where my dad, my father used to say he was from a rare breed. He was born in California and he went back to Nebraska and grew up in Nebraska. Usually people leave Nebraska for California and he went the other way. Mm -hmm. And then as an adult, he left Nebraska and, um, and went to Europe and then onward from there. But I loved mm -hmm. Nebraska because of the people who were there. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was there. She and I were extremely close. She was a great reader of books. Um, she was a big world traveler. Uh, she and I were very close. Um, when I was a senior in college, I remember I applied for an American Express uh, card and you got, you got a free ticket anywhere in the United States. And I elected to use my ticket to go see her. It was a free ticket, which meant I had to take like seven airplanes to get to Nebraska from New York City. <laughs> um, but we had a great time. We, I remember we talked all about the Brontes and drove all around the, the, the prairie together and, um, and ate sorbet. Mm -hmm. That was what we did. Um, so, but it was very different. Nebraska was very different once she was gone and once mm -hmm. my father was gone. I felt incredibly right. exposed, you know, mm -hmm. because when I was growing up and I was their beloved grandchild and child, it was a very different experience. And then I thought, wow, I really don't blend into the scenery in the same way that I thought I did. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, that required examination. I also, and then there were a bunch of other things that get discussed in the book, like, you know, we had this farm and I suddenly realized I didn't know how to do anything on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, I had relied on all of these other people who knew exactly what farming was and how it worked, and I knew nothing, you know. And then from there, I sort of thought, well, what does that really mean that I don't know what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, near the end of the book, one of the car one of the um, people in it, Emily, says you've been on a pilgrimage, and um, I'm not sure I agree with that. Even though religion figures very big in the no in here in the novel, figures figures very big in in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about that, but it almost sounds like this kind of, the, 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 it is a kind of, a, it, it, not a kind of, it is a trog. And in a way, it's a kind of if, books that I think we have to have this way of thinking only men write. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it's this, this, this kind of, um, because, you know, we, we just have this idea and we're gonna, we're gonna be, um, we're going to grab the dog, Charlie, because we're John Stanwyck and we're going to explore the heartland and so on. Um, I know. I even, I even start, have a map. Did you know when you're when, Huh? I even have huh? a map. I even have a map. Yeah, like a, what, a man has a map. Yeah, show us. And, <laughs> yeah, show us. And then we'll talk about, how, did, did you know this was going to become a kind of a, an actual journey, not just a journey of changing minds or so on, but an actual physical journey? Okay, so here's my map which I think I have prepped. Can you see the map? Is it showing up? I think so. I think it's showing up. I think there's something you need to do to make it full screen. You are screen sharing. Yep. There. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hopefully you can see the map. Um, and, I, and I guess I will point out on the map, the important things are that the blue dotted line is the road, is the journey, is the quest um, that the harvesters take and that I um, and that I follow. It starts in Texas and everybody's telling me the map is up. Okay, good. And so it starts in Texas and then goes north to Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, dips over to Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, and then Idaho. Um, and the reason it follows that route is because that's the order in which the wheat ripens as you know, you start in the South and the mm -hmm. earth is burning and the sun like heats the wheat and it gradually gets riper until you end up in, you start in Texas in May and then end up in Idaho in September. Um, and then the map also includes a couple of historical routes. There's the old cattle runs, which are in green. 
there's the Oregon Trail, uh, which is also, you know, the, there's the Mormon Trail, which ran uh, mm -hmm. kind of parallel to it, and then the Transcontinental Railroad. And then you see a couple of some of the modern day um, reservations and forts. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the places and some of the periods of history that the book intersects with. Um, and I don't remember precisely what your question was, but I will say that when I started, okay, I'm going to end my screen sharing now. Mm -hmm. um, where did you go? Oh, there you are. Well, I'm here. When I started writing, I had no idea that, that all of that was going to go into the book. I mean, I just had this question and I had a bunch of issues that I wanted to explore. Um, and I knew mm -hmm. from the process of the previous book, which was set in Japan, that if I followed my curiosity and the things that were interesting to me uh, and the people mm -hmm. who were telling that I would end up with a story. But what initially made you curious? Because I mean, well, not every idea, there's a book there. I mean, there were two things and I really was going on faith that there would be a book. Um, mm -hmm. The first was, I had learned that there was this thing called narrative nonfiction, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, mm -hmm. I only knew about fiction and novels and I thought that's all I would write, but I learned that there's this thing that people in New York like called narrative nonfiction <laughs> um, or, or literary nonfiction or I don't know, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. And I was in the farm in Nebraska looking around me, literally thinking, wow, nobody in New York knows anything about any of this. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really interesting and nobody knows how combines work. And I think the people who work on the farm are all Christian because they're all, all the women are wearing skirts and nobody's wearing any makeup. I wonder why, you know, mm -hmm. there was like the, just that sort of basic level of curiosity. But then the driving question was when I would talk to people in New York and say, hey, I have this farm in Nebraska. The first question they would ask me was, um, is it organic? <laughs> Mm -hmm. which it's not. <clears throat> and then I thought, well, why are these people who I know in the city atheists and they all believe in evolution and they're all buying organic food at Whole Foods and yet people working on the farm uh, are, are open to GMOs and think that organic is kind of even amusing but mm -hmm. are very devout Christians. Like wh what's going on there? Mm -hmm. So that was the that, that was the origin yeah. of it. I mean... That's usually how um, narratives, whether fiction or non-fiction, tend to start. It's 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 a question we want answered. It's a it's almost a mystery we need to solve. So you end up with even whether one of the things I think that's that fiction and non-fiction having may have in common, and and you write both, is that it's a kind of detective work. Yes, yes, yeah. right. It's, yes, um, you know, you're doing that gray spade thing. You're getting under the rock of it. <laughs> well, I didn't know what the answer was. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, it, it would be boring. And the funny thing, of course, with nonfiction is you you sell a book on what they call on a proposal. What you're supposed to say, "I'm going to write this book, and here's what it here's what it's about." But actually, you don't know what the thing is about until you're done. But you're still supposed to say mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. So that that can be mm -hmm. challenging. But it's it's really not. Um, it wouldn't have been interesting to me if I had been aware from the beginning what I was going to run into. So mm -hmm. you know, hopefully as the reader reads it, they discover things and that's because I was at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, without giving away too much, I think let's talk about one, one of the things that surprised you in writing this. One of the things that surprised me? Mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> Because it was narrative nonfiction, mm -hmm. um, I thought I will I will do this. What what I thought that you know, and I really was old enough to know better. But I thought, well, I will just make this book about the world that I see and the people that I'm describing, and I will try to do the in my mind. I'll just try to you know do the John McPhee, Ian Fraser thing of observing people and writing down what I'm seeing and, and the mm -hmm. characters who I'm with are going to become the main actors in the story. And I am just an observer. Um, mm -hmm. And this became difficult. And it became difficult because I, I don't, I don't look like Ian Frazier. Right. Um, and so the world around me kept responding to me to the point that, you know, people would, would wonder who I was and what I was doing there. And 
um, was I a Native American? Was it was a situation that I ran into all the time, and it kept intruding on the story, and that was not something that I was was prepared for, um, and it, so it ended up making me work even harder. Um, I, I think in terms of just technically writing the story, I, I really resisted having to put myself in the story. I really didn't want mm -hmm. to. You know, to the point that that I had to have these intense conversations with my editor, where he said, "You need to be present on page one. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't just suddenly show up partway through the story." Uh, and so mm -hmm. that was really a really big surprise for me. And I think the degree to which I became uh, in, invested in portraying history was uh, was also a surprise for me because that wasn't mm -hmm. something that I was planning on doing. Yeah. Um... One of the things that, that resonated for me, me personally, because it's my background as well, was when you started to have these, I mean, regular contact, but it'd be in, in basically sharing lives with evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, having sort of come out of that background as well, a lot of that sort of um, resonated. And it's going to be interesting talking to Justin when he comes on, comes on later. Um, yeah, I, I am without you know again, it's it's hard to talk about this without without giving giving too much away. But do you think there's anything um about their perspective that may have maybe at the time maybe permanently changed yours? Um yes. Now there were multiple mm -hmm. perspectives that I ran into, right? Like Right. Just again, without giving everything away, um, we begin to have to wrestle with the book of Revelation and the Bible mm -hmm. right? pretty early because there are people in the book who oh, they're apocalyptic uh, evangelicals, yes, there are people who believe in the apocalypse, ah. and, 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 and also on this journey, it's the first time in my life where I was going to church every Sunday, I had never had that experience mm -hmm. before, but because we're traveling from Texas all the way to Idaho, um, and by the time we get to mm -hmm. Idaho, it's you know, we're a farming ground that is owned by the Shoshone Bannock tribe, but is farmed by Mormons. And here mm -hmm. we are, Christians living in a trailer in the casino RV park, right? So that's a lot of mm -hmm. US, and that's all, yeah, that's our country. That's all US history right. that has to be understood within the context of the story. But we start from Texas and then go all the way to Idaho. And so that's a lot of very different churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including you know including a mega church in Oklahoma um so there were multiple right. points of view and so not not only was I confronted with going to church every day with praying every day but with numerous ideas of what Christianity is and what God is and 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 so I was trying to to process it to see if there was anything in it that made any sense to me and absolutely I think my worldview has permanently ch been changed um mm -hmm. there are minor ways a silly example would be um, I was in Switzerland a couple of years ago and there was a virtual reality Protestant Reformation um, mm -hmm. tent. Did I tell you this story? No. I put on, I put on the goggles and the headset and I had to go through and reenact the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Which is a whole interesting experience in and of itself because I now have the physical memory of having um, helped destroy icons in a church. Mm -hmm. And so then later when I went into a church and I saw actual, you know, heads of Mary that had been severed from statues and were kept in the church crypt, I was like, oh, I know why they did that. Mm -hmm. And it, so every time I go into a church, I have this different, in Europe, I have this completely different experience. I had thought of the Protestant Reformation as being this time when Gutenberg created the Bible and then everybody could read. I didn't mm -hmm. think of all of the tensions and the, the great impact, the cultural impact that this event had had on the world. So, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. like, a, that's like an understanding of history that I hadn't had before. But yeah. I think some of the deeper spiritual questions, which, which are not resolved in my mind, um, have also been very, very impacted. I've written a lot about Japan. I've written a lot about Buddhism. And I've written a lot about Shinto, which is an animistic mm -hmm. religion in Japan. Um, and one of the things that I think about is how, for example, tied Shinto is to Japan, the place. 
and how mm -hmm. portable Christianity has become. And I think mm -hmm. that's really fascinating. Well, what, what I, I, I'm curious to, to, to not to belabor it, but I'm curious that um, whenever, whenever you're writing about place, um, religion does come up. And I'm, I'm, if, if, if you ever thought why, why um, that becomes something that becomes really interesting to you or something that crops up in, in your narratives. Um, I do. I, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not baptized. I'm not officially a member of any religion. Um, mm -hmm. but I, you know, the question is, one of the questions is, is this all meaningless? Mm -hmm. Um, and are we supposed to be nice to each other just to be nice to each other? Or is there some cosmic, you know, greater meaning? Um, is, mm -hmm. there, is there something behind the experience of being human that um, has a capacity to elevate us? N mm -hmm. Not like, because we have brain chemistry that's making us, faking us out into thinking that life means something, but is there in fact some greater meaning? And I feel like that, you know, that's a really interesting and important question to me. You know, is love a real thing or are we mm -hmm. just, this assembly of atoms and the meanings that we apply to our relationships and things that are important to us is that all stuff that we've created and it's all fake mm -hmm. um i'm on yep. the side of thinking that no it, that, that it matters mm -hmm. there is a so i'll tell you what the scene so there's a scene in or something you say in in this narrative that conjured up something for me i'm going to tell you what it conjured up first and then tell you how the scene reacted to it. It ran me once. I was in this look. This seemed totally out of the blue. So I'm in Minneapolis, and we're at a gay bar, a gay club, and somebody asked, and I hated it. And somebody asked me, "Why did I hate this gay bar?" And I said, "You know, if you like the gay, you'll love this bar. If you <laughs> hate the gay, you'll still love this bar." Mm. And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I think." in order to reach out to the mainstream, they have erased something of themselves. And so when I read, when you talked about um, in order to sort of build this bridge, in order to build this empathy, it's particularly with Christianity, would you have to diminish something of yourself? And it made me wonder, is that an, uh, still an unresolved question? Is that something that, that um, you still sort of think about? Because I still think about if the price for connection is sort of a diminishing or erasing of your own character. No, <laughs> I refuse mm -hmm. to accept that. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't want to live with a diminished sense of self. And I know that that's kind of, those are sort of the options we give ourselves, right? Like there's mm -hmm. um, your authentic spirit, which may be prickly and well, let's, I would look at it two ways. One is um, there's our authentic self, which might be prickly and doesn't fit in particularly well and, um, and has to go find the mm -hmm. right bar to hang out in. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of Christianity, the, the way that I, and I, it's not like I've come to the end of how I feel about all of this, but one thing mm -hmm. that I have, come to feel is I think it's really worth taking a step back and saying, wait a second, what, what is Christianity? Mm -hmm. Because I suspect that a lot of what we say it is or think it is, is not what it is. And I also think the questions around what Christianity is, I I've come to, you know, I felt like I felt very excited that I was asking that question, except I've come to realize mm -hmm. that people have been asking that question for hundreds of years and saying, wait a second, you've got mm -hmm. it wrong. Your version of Christianity is oppressive. Well, people said that, you know, 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they've said that many times, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a scene early in the book when we're at a church in Texas and Eric says, you know, do you, would your friends want to go to this church? And I say, no, um, A, because I hadn't understood a single thing the pastor had said because the pastor kept talking about restoring the church and I had no mm -hmm. idea what he was talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, but also, you know, a lot of my friends would think this is stupid. So we mm -hmm. had to, we had to unpack what that meant, but I've since come to understand that th this, 
worry that the way in which Christianity is practiced is wrong and needs to be restored is this thing that Christians have worried about for an extremely long time. Oh yeah, for, for I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I can call church, we spend a lot of time dating with our Christianity. Um, the thing is, well, I don't I want to, to say to the thing that's funny, Marlon, to... is that I teach, it, I teach now at Catholic University, and I tried to talk about this with the theologians, and they were like, what are you talking about? And then I realized, oh, that's, duh, that's right. They, the Catholic Church is the church. So they don't sit around wondering if they're supposed to restore the church. You know, it was like a major foot in mouth <laughs> moment for Murray. Uh -huh. Anyways, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I was thinking, we talked a lot about church. Um, can we talk about, I'm going to talk about farming. Like, how, what, what's your relationship now to, to, actually, what's your relationship to food? Um, as I'm sheltering, I eat too much of it. <laughs> um, and, um, I mean, the, the, the pandemic has sort of upended everything, right? Because right. now we have to eat the food that we make. So mm -hmm. the, the, whatever ideal uh, diet I might have pursued before I was sheltering at home has has become far more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny, I was talking to my cousin the other day and I said, the stories in the news about the food supply are gonna focus on lettuce and milk um, because those are the things that are, you know, are in the news for, for being destroyed because they can't, there's certain farmers who are not able to get their milk and to, not to supply the food chain with the with mm -hmm. milk um, because there are areas in the in the production cycle that have fallen apart. Um, mm -hmm. But grains are still going to be a staple, and because grains are portable, uh, and I've always known this. This was always my father always used to say this to me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're living it, and uh, I I find that um, very eerie and. Um, and also very true. And I realized, you know, before the pandemic, we were living at a time where we could get whatever we wanted out of season, prepared mm -hmm. or grown mm -hmm. however we wanted. And that's much more difficult now. And I had always been told that, that was the case mm -hmm. um, and sort of understood it intellectually. And now I'm living it, you know. And then in a few weeks, um, Justin's father, Eric, is going to load up his equipment on the back of his trucks and drive out to Texas to start cutting wheat. And there will be mm -hmm. enough grain in this country, certainly, for us to eat. Mm -hmm. Eric is one of the characters who who figures pretty hugely in this, um, you know, in the in this in this narrative. Um, it was good. Do you think that did, did at what point did you figure? Did you realize that he would be one of the characters you'd be writing a lot about? I think because it's again, it's yeah. Sorry, go. Ahead. Cause, cause why? Hmm? No, because I think I guess especially for a, a book where you, it's not as if as you're saying before, when you start writing it, you know where it's, where it's gonna go, or you know how which character, who, which people you're gonna spend a lot of time with, or people who are gonna change, even how you write in the direction of your story. Yeah, so I'm curious about the 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 people who ended up being, for want of a better word, the major characters. I think it was clear that Eric, I knew that Eric would be a major character. I don't think that I knew uh, necessarily right away that Justin, uh, we should probably bring him on pretty soon, that Justin was going to yeah, be such a probably character. Probably like a couple of minutes. And I think that um, because I didn't fully, I I didn't, I didn't fully under, well, I didn't understand. <laughs> There's a scene early mm -hmm. in the book where Justin, before the trip, Justin and I are driving along and he's very upset and he's upset about the the last election he's because mm -hmm. it's the election is impending and he says in the book i'm afraid my people are going to screw up this election and i say mm -hmm. and i have no idea what he's talking about and i say well who do you what do you mean do you mean white people and he says no no i mean my people are evangelical christians um mm -hmm. and i didn't know that that's what they were considered mm -hmm. um and he had a a, a desire to share with me what his experience had been um mm -hmm. 
And I had no idea that that was the case. And, and I didn't know how deep that went and how powerful it was. I had no idea all the places that would take me. Um, so that was all an incredible surprise. And mm -hmm. there was a sort of a core to Eric that I trusted and my father had died saying, if something ever happens to me, you should feel that you could trust Eric. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've never said this, but I think one of the things that's been very interesting to me is learning um, almost to the core, I think, like what his faith is comprised of mm -hmm. and how that comes out in his person uh, and, and seeing kind of the from beginning to end how that how that works. Um, mm -hmm. That was also a really interesting um, experience, and yeah. go ahead. Yeah, no, I was saying one of the, the things that um, really interesting, and we and, and we'll bring in Justin after this is for people who haven't read this book, they may already or they may have some ideas about it, um, good and bad. Um, that they yeah. may think, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, liberal person goes into non-liberal territory and, and writes about how they, you know, how they found themselves and found each other, which it's not. And it's not <laughs> that, and it's also wicked because narratives like these sometimes have that, and they smack of this kind of condescension where the, the whole thing is about, let me show you about my arc. Well, everybody else remains kind of one note and, 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 you know, and one dimensional. And one of the great things about Eric and Justin who would meet is how often they, not that you're, not that you're, you're ever, you're ever going to reduce them just the way in which they continually complicate and, 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 and sort of, and make the, the story more complex, particularly Justin, who we should bring in his ears must be ringing. Can we bring in so, Justin, please? Can we bring, Calling Justin. You should give us. You should give Justin a little introduction. Um. Well, Melanie did. Melanie did sort of introduce him. Right. We. Justin is I'm not a. I'm seeing an icon, but I'm not seeing him. Uh, Deborah. Well, there he is. Hello. Are your, are your ears Justin, how's it going? I've been. I've been tuned in. I'm. Yeah. I'm. Oh, okay. Well, so much for that, Dad. <laughs> um, Justin, thanks for thanks for coming and thanks for for um, being a part of this discussion. I hope it's not as oh, well. My my audio is kind of jumping in and out, but I hope I mean my video is jumping in. I hope the audio is clear. We hear you. You're I all hear hearing you. me still. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, think about just just that you you're when I was reading this. Um, the, the the first like all out laugh in the book. I'm not gonna give the scene. I was gonna what you said. You just said that's called irony. <laughs> How do you remember that scene? Which is like the first all out laugh, you know, in in in, in the book. Um, could you just because again, you're 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 from this background, but you're also um, you're studying English, right? Uh, I didn't remember. Remember. I can't remember. I did my undergrad in English. In English. Now I'm working on my master's in counseling. Yeah, but still very much an English guy, I'd say. Yeah. What drove you to do to 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 um, English undergrad English? Um. Well, I did this this first year study at my university, uh, where it's focused on mm -hmm. um, ministry and urban settings, and I kind of had to choose a major after that. And I think I had just mm -hmm. like really enjoyed doing one or two research papers at the end of that semester or something. And I kind of just thought like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So English kind of fits anything. Um, they were good papers. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I really <laughs> enjoyed communicating. Um, I never considered myself a good reader, but yeah, I just, I, I figured it would be a helpful skill to develop. Um, and I really started to love mm -hmm. it after that. Yeah, he's a very good what are you writer. Been reading, I'm curious. What am I reading right now? Yeah, uh, yeah. American Harvest by Marie Mockett. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was just I was reading some John Stein. You might know some um, of the characters in it. <laughs> I was reading some John Steinbeck. Um, I 
been reading this book by Marcus Borg and N.T. Wright, and it's like two takes mm -hmm. on Jesus and his significance. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I, I mainly stay in nonfiction. Um, I'd like to enjoy mm -hmm. fiction more here at the Center for Fiction. But You're um, trying to say you haven't read my book? Is that what you're trying to say? I have not read your book yet, no. <laughs> but I've, uh, I've, I've listened to your podcast, so. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. You know, so one of the things, I, I, you know, somebody, I saw one of the texts talking about um, this turning into a Calvinist conversation real quick, mm. exegesis real quick. I would comment on that, but I have no idea what exegesis means. Um, Justin would know. Yeah, the, 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 I, I, huh? Justin will yeah, know. It's, it's, um, yeah. Uh -huh. There is a there. I'm curious about this sort of you talk about this evolution versus creationism debates and where you you stand on it. And yeah, I think you quote his his um, interpretation of of the of Genesis, mm -hmm. if I remember. Yep. And um, yeah. And the thing it reminds me, it reminds me, and 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 bear in mind, all all the stuff this book reminds me are way far away from this book. We should tell you about the appeal of this book. So there is a there's a tribe in the Kalahari Desert that um, have this theory about the Milky Way, which is that a little girl grabbed uh, grabbed a, 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 a basically a bucket full of dust and threw it in the sky, and it became the Milky Way. And everybody focuses so much on the little girl throwing a bucket. Nobody realizes that Bushmen discovered the Milky Way. <laughs> and the thing I'm talking, and the point I was, you know, sort of getting at is, I was wondering if that paragraph you wrote about about Genesis that is it that the the, the way in which we're explaining the phenomenon of God is not so much relevant as the fact that we recognize He's there. I don't yeah. know if, if I'm making that. Yeah. No, that that seems in line, uh, kind of with what I was discovering. I, I think I found that there. Um, the debate was often like, is it is it metaphorical? Is it factual? And I thought um, there there are all kinds of justifications for why it's completely fact, um, mm -hmm. or you know what are perceived as justification. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of I discovered that sort of bypassed like the true significance of the the story. Um, I mm -hmm. began to find. Uh, writers and, and authors and researchers that are finding these like really profound things about, you know, what the Bible says mm -hmm. about God and what it says about humans and the earth. Mm -hmm. And um, that comes through so much better, I'd say, in in metaphor, in, um, in yeah. allegory. But that's not, well, that's if not somebody's just that. listening, yeah. So if Go somebody's ahead. just listening to this or been listening for a while, they'd be wondering, how come a book where that's primarily about farming, we're talking so much about God so much? Which makes me think, how much of, um, could we, could either we talk about just how central our religion is to the heartland? And maybe yeah. why, why that is so? Marie, thoughts? <laughs> well, I mean, a couple that of reasons. Yes, no answer. I, I, <laughs> Well, I was going to say really quickly, one, one of the, another one of the debates that we constantly have in the book that's related to what you're saying, Marlon, is the whole idea mm -hmm. of whether we're supposed to even have church. Like mm -hmm. debate, are we, you know, where in the Bible does Jesus say you have to go to church? Right. There's a, there's a, mm -hmm. a, a moment in the book where Justin says, well, I, he never said we're supposed to go to church. Right. So to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, you actually have to go to church, the building. Um, is that what it's all about? Mm -hmm. um, which is where the, you know, the question becomes even deeper and then opens up even more this question of, well, what is Christianity? So that's A. B, um, in terms of, you, you know, <laughs> I have a couple of answers as for, for why faith is such a big deal on the heartland. Um, and I'm not a historian or, you know, like somebody who mm -hmm. studied intensely the demographics of the United States, but it partly has to do with the way in which it was settled, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it also has to do with, um, I mean, I think 
farming, you're dealing, one of the pictures I was going to show is of, um, of hail, a piece of hail that is like this big. And I was going to say that we had a storm where there were pieces of hail that were this big, which came down and utterly decimated mm -hmm. the crop. Um, so that was the end of that field. Um, and it, there's a way in which farming requires people to have faith that you put the seed in the ground, that it'll come up and that it'll grow. And, you know, mm -hmm. in a way that is very different than we schedule our lives. Like we decided today that we were going to meet online at five, my time, eight, your time. And here mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. um, and I have mm -hmm. friends still, even though I say to them, I don't know when the wheat will be ripe. They'll still say, so when is the wheat going to be ripe? Because they mm -hmm. want to schedule it to come out and see it and to see harvest. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. not the way mm -hmm. the farmers live at any level. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think yeah. there's, I do think that there is something to that in, in what is required from the, the person. Um, so those are sort of two very different answers and two very different reasons. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think, you know, that, that, that there are ways in which, um, and Justin can speak to this better than I can, but there are probably ways in which what people in charge of um, major denominations have, have said is important in Christianity that is, um, um, non-inclusive, not helpful. Mm -hmm. And those of us who live in the same who really greatly value our d diversity, don't want to have anything to do with that kind of Christianity, um, mm -hmm. which is not to say that there aren't also um, churches and cities that are inclusive, but those are three different answers I have. What do you think, mm -hmm. Justin? Oh uh, yeah, I was really, I was tracking mostly with the, um, the part about that there's a certain amount of faith to the agricultural process and um mm -hmm. it's sort of this idea of people kind of being in the dirt and like producing food that you know you need to survive so there's something very basically human about that um whole experience and i think that's sort of um i mean going back to the the genesis thing there, there's something you know, wherever humans are, there's some form of religion. There's some sort of some some sort of greater thought about what's going on with it all. And so, I think that people that are their lives are devoted to working on the ground and um, bringing food from it. Like, mm -hmm. I think it makes it, it makes sense to to think that way. It's very it's very active. It's very um, mm -hmm. personal for them. Um, so it's not to say okay, that there are to pull problems, but that would be like a total, um, you know, right. contradiction in one way. I have to wait because my my internet is all spotty, so sometimes you guys are still talking. I didn't realize it. Um, yeah. So so can we put this to rest? Organic food is it bullshit, or is there such a thing? Oh, I mean, I think there's a degree to which that it, it can be a, it can be a real thing. I just I just think it's um, I, I <laughs> there's it's sure really it's I mean, not total yeah. no. I've, what? Got, I've got some stuff in the garden right now that's 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 very organic. Mm. Yeah, I remember but probably my, my label. friend of mine who's a biologist said, you know, pit, a friend of mine who's a biologist used to say, you know, petroleum's organic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, that there are, but you know, anything like, like um, you and I were talking yesterday about the term empathy, like empathy is now a thing and I'm a contrarian. So the minute anything is a thing, I get very skeptical. Um, mm -hmm. So we could make fun of, of empathy too. You know, I feel like that's a term yeah, that's yeah. overused. Well, one of the things I, cause I said your book is a remarkable work of empathy and one of the reasons why it is is because it don't it try to be. <laughs> and I think um, that, um, in fact, emp your empathy reminded me of the or original Greek word, the original Greek meaning of sympathy, which was understanding between us, mm. which people take to mean empathy now, but it really is. And that's the thing where the, the, the book is, is, is in a very, very, very simple way, a book about understanding. Um, you know? Um, Justin, you, you and Mary talk about a lot of things. What are some of the things you guys talked about? Uh, I guess there was a lot of like explaining what's going on in Harvest, like the, the process. And the what, farming? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, like so, yeah, how you know, managed to drive the tractor. Um, I mean, there was like, I would find podcasts or, you know, books that I was, I was taking in and I would kind of think like, this is really saying what I'm thinking right now. And I'd pass that along to Marie. So we were, it was, I mean, with me, yeah. it was like, like what? Christianity. Or a podcast like what? Um, I was really into the liturgist podcast uh, for a, lo a long time. Mm -hmm. um, Bad Christian for a long time. Um, I'm going to jump in as the writer and say one of the things that Justin would talk about a lot that I didn't understand at the beginning and I understand better now is he would say, I hope there's something there and I hope that it's good. That was something he would say a lot. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I think you do well to show those moments, Marie. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. that summer kind of hit perfectly where like I most hoped for that to be there, but I also felt the most skeptical of it. Like it was the most... Mm -hmm. um, unsure that I was so like yeah it was like a sweet spot or not, I mean it wasn't a very enjoyable yeah. sweet spot for for a character in a book it was pretty good <laughs> so do you read I'm curious about because um I also come from ev evangelical background and I remember I used to read a lot of um, books like the scandal of the evangelical mind and stuff like blue like jazz mm. Uh, yeah, I, I read Blue Like Jazz in high school, and I, 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 it blew my mind. Yeah, shit. Blue I read Blue Like Jazz when I was, was like 30. So, <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what about it blew your mind? Uh, I, I really want to read it again. I really like Those Donald. Those read Blue Like Jazz, you should like, though, if you wanted to read a, 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 a sort of a contemporary Christian philosophy book on par with anything, anything, great thinking and work blue like jazz is the book anyway you're saying mm -hmm. uh yeah i think it it kind of i think i read it when i was a sophomore in high school i had this like mandatory reading time mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. i think it uh so it was like thoroughly christian like it was fully christian but it was also it seemed more mm. unnecessarily it's not like i hadn't encountered anything real before but like it was just it was very real and it was a guy that was quite obviously kind of struggling with things and trying to hold Christianity in the world and a society mm -hmm. that didn't, um, didn't think there was anything to it. Like didn't think there was any credibility to it. So I, I look back on it now and see that that's, there's an obvious reason why I was drawn to it. Um, I didn't really know it at the time that it would right. sort of become my own story too, but yeah, I, I was super drawn yeah. to Donald. Cool. Um, when we get to some, I want to get to a few questions so we don't um, run out of time without um, asking some. Um, one was saying we would love to hear Justin's perspective on what it was like to be a subject of a book and how he thought that went, how he thought the season went. I said, uh, the rest is Justin. I recall Mary you saying that your father thought the end of the book wasn't positive enough and didn't reflect what you thought was accomplished in terms of opening up dialogue. What do you think about what's your perspective on being one of the subjects of the book? That's an audience question. Mm. Uh, I often kind of forgot. I don't know. I just <laughs> I, like me and Marie had had formed a good friendship, and it was it just really felt like we were just we were both trying to figure stuff out. So I really didn't think about it a whole lot. I, I remember one time when Marie referred to me or maybe it was like me and, the, and my family as subjects. And it was like, mm -hmm. it's kind of a weird word um, oh. because it just didn't have that dynamic. Um, so, but that, <laughs> that it was, it was very mm -hmm. cool. Um, I, I think, there were moments when I thought I was saying something really important and really cool. And I thought, Oh, that'll make it in the book. And then there are other things that I don't really remember saying, or I think Marie remembered in a better way than I actually said it. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it was, mm -hmm. it was cool. Um, and that would happen. He would say that you make me sound really great. And I would say, no, that's something that you said. <laughs> you said that. And, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. It says, do you think that faith in the crop carries over to faith in the family? And if so, 
I'd be interested in knowing Justin's thoughts on infidelity and how sacred marriage is in the church. That's a heavy question. That's almost like four questions. Yeah. Well, is that? I think you already you kind of spoke to it a little bit before. Which part? You're saying, Justin? Oh, I think when we're talking about um, just uh, planting things and what seeing it grow, that's kind of a faith thing as well. Mm, yeah, very much. So. I think um, you said something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. And there's a sort mm -hmm. of a clarification where she says, "Is living? Does Justin feel that living that is sacred, one of fidelity, etc., that it helps one believe in a successful crop?" That living is sacred, um, and its relation to being harvest. a farmer. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. I mean, we both have met farmers who probably don't think about that. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So in some ways, I feel um, like I didn't write about those people. I think. Um, mm -hmm. I think for someone like my dad, um, you know, who who is very thoughtful. Um, but not always like in his own ways, he's a romantic, but um, in he's not like very sentimental or something like, so like there, uh, he would have that base understanding that like through farming, he would have gathered or, or come to believe that life is sacred and the work of a farmer is honorable and teaches us mm -hmm. something about man and God. Um, but I kind of had the, uh, and there are plenty of farmers that think that. I, I just, in my experience, it seems like I kind of had a way to come to think about that through being somewhat of an outsider and ending up being mm -hmm. more of a, a words guy. And I like poetry and stuff. And like, I, you know, I have enough mm -hmm. of that like college kid vibe to. Like, you don't I like. Back on the background that I had. Right. Mm hmm. Primary. What you, you said, don't, Marie? You don't love the I don't think you love the machinery, right? So you, I mean. I love operating it. I, I've always loved that. Yeah. But I, I mean, I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm like totally not a farmer in that regard. Um, I'm pretty, pretty good at driving stuff. But if it breaks, I have to call over the real farmers. I know this question They're wasn't directed. Your future is not farming. No. No, unfortunately. Sorry, we spoke at the same time. Oh, I was just going to say, I know the question wasn't directed at me, but from my mm -hmm. observation, um, and if Eric were here, Eric is so modest, he would not get up and pontificate on the importance of fidelity and leading a sacred life and how that turns into a great co crop, because he's not mm -hmm. a, he's, um, that's just not how he talks. Um, he's not mm -hmm. an infomercial person. But that's, mm -hmm. that's clearly, and this I hope this comes through in the book, that's clearly what he's also trying to teach the young men who are on the crew. And there's a great scene in Idaho where one of the combines breaks down and he's mm -hmm. trying to think of how to fix it and we can't get a part. The closest part is 900 miles away. And then he remembers somebody who had been on his crew years before who's moved to Idaho, who's a great welder. And, and that guy helps him fix the combine in exchange for getting to drive the combine with his son, his nine-year-old son. Mm -hmm. um, and you can sort of feel in that moment, nobody says anything, but you can feel in that moment how important it was for Eric to have um, had this experience with this guy and kind of handed off a healthy form of masculinity to one of the young mm -hmm. men in his crew who he then hopes is gonna model this behavior for his son. Um, mm -hmm. All of which goes into, yes, raising a healthy crop. And, you know, there was plenty of conversation on the road about that guy's a good farmer. That guy's not a good farmer. That guy's a really good mm -hmm. farmer, you know, and this quiet observing of how people live in the crop that they produce. But Eric's not a luxury guy. So you never get mm -hmm. the, the sort of the judgment. He, he's really one of the most unjudgmental people I've ever met. It reminds me of my father in this way. He's just very unjudgmental. Mm -hmm. Um, of what people do, but aware of how, you know, this kind of healthy approach to living um, can impact all areas of one's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, oh, let me, we got one more question. Uh, 
<laughs> Since Murray, you mentioned Pat Metheny as an influence on the book in a Lit Hub interview. Elaborate. <laughs> well, I think I think in the sense that, uh, uh, and I can't mention a track off the top of my head, but Pat Metheny, um, and I think I also said Michael Brecker, and there's certain songs that capture this huge, expansive yes, Americana feeling that I would feel. There's a scene that's not in the book where Eric and I were playing music for each other and his was a Mennonite rock band and mine was, I think, either Pat Metheny or Michael Brecker. And we were trying to say like, this huge open landscape is like this piece of music. So mm -hmm. I think that that's what I, was, that's what I was going for. Yeah. Um, another one for you, Marie, after writing this book, how has your perception of the, your Nebraska family changed, if at all, from your memories of them in childhood? Um, I miss them terribly. Mm -hmm. um, I understand more deeply why, you know, my father loved Eric and trusted him and they were on the surface so very different, but I understand how sort of at the core they valued certain things about people um, and humanity that were similar. Mm -hmm. And I see that in a very sort of naked way that's very moving to me. Um, I'm mm -hmm. also at the same time acutely aware of how ridiculous it is that I go to a farm in Nebraska because I don't, I'm not a capable person, you know? <laughs> I'm like mm -hmm. <laughs> sneezing because it's dusty and it's hot. And I took my son and, and he was upset over I don't know, something that happened with, with um, there were too many, I think, prairie dogs. And of course, there's only one way to get rid of prairie dogs. And that was upsetting to a small city child who loves animals. And, you know, I like, I don't know how to function on a farm. And so I feel, um, <laughs> I feel like I can't really meet my responsibility. And so that's something, that's something that weighs on my mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's a second part to that. Oh, I don't know where that's second part of that question went it was uh oh, and what is the most challenging reconciliation you've made between new york organic milk gluten sensitive consumers and a nebraskan farming community you've come to understand what is the biggest way what is I'm... the most challenging reconciliation or reconciliation i don't know how you pronounce it here i don't know that i've 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 managed to come up with a reconciliation i mean i think like the per personally yeah. the most challenging thing would be that people think I wrote this book uh, out of a form of apology or that I'm a, an apologist or that I think that mm -hmm. conversation and connection mean, as you were sort of alluding to a little while ago, the suppression of something important. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to think that we can, um, and, and I'm really not like a huge John Lennon fan, but I really would like to think that there ought to be a way for us to imagine ways to talk to each other that we haven't thought of before that we don't just go down one of these you know prefabricated scripts for how mm -hmm. to negotiate um our relationships with each other so mm -hmm. that's probably the hardest thing for me is feeling that because i spent time writing a book that said in nebraska that i'm somehow um acting in any way as an apologist um mm -hmm. which i which you know yeah. which i know I Mm -hmm. um, Justin, how great you think this great divide is? I think that's something Eric said, but how, how great you think it is? Uh, I guess it depends on when you ask me. Because, um, yeah, there are sometimes I have really, you know, great hope at the, the tools we have now to understand each other better. Um, but I mean, this book was uh, an example of the difficulties that are there um mm -hmm. so like as someone who can kind of have my foot in both camps so to speak uh, um it mm -hmm. i can just sense how, how very different people are um in uh, in the same state in the same county you know but especially in the same mm -hmm. country so like it's it's very great i guess um and that's one of the things me and Marie talked about. It's like, yeah, how do you overcome that? Um, unfortunately, there's not mm -hmm. a great short, you know, bullet points to to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Well, the conversation, of course, is 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 for now the most 
probably the most important thing because we're not even talking. So I think right. even that in a sense is is great. Um, I think we might be out of time. So final question for Marie from Suzanne. It says at the start of the interview, you at the start of the interview, you, you mentioned realizing how little you knew about farming despite owning a farm. What was the most personal and meaningful thing you've come to learn about farming and farmers? Um, without giving away too much of your book. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's almost a another um, language and culture, which is um, which is really precious and really vital. And mm -hmm. it's it's funny sometimes I talk to other writers who are based in one of the heartland states, and they'll say to me like, "Well, guys who are really good at farming almost have another operating system." You know, like mm -hmm. you can show them like one of the things that happens all the time with farmers is they look at the inside of it like a like they look at an engine and they know how to fix it. This this was a recurring um, thing that I ran into and, or I would talk to somebody on Eric's crew and say, how did you get into how did you become a harvester? And the story was almost always, well, I just loved taking engines apart and putting them back together again, mm -hmm. which is like a whole form of intelligence that is that is um, completely different than than mine if i have any you know it's not this verbal yeah, base my brother. your brother's like that oh yeah even from four or even from he was 12 um didn't really give a damn about school but the car would not work and he was just i mean 12 year old looking and go oh and it's and it's driving he just had a genius for it yeah. it's an amazing it's just an amazing kind of intelligence where these guys could hear things and sense things and it's nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, even yesterday, I, while I've been sheltering, I've been doing a lot of bird watching and I got very upset yesterday because a squirrel got on my bird feeder and I sent a picture to Eric and I said, I have a new problem. And I immediately get this text back. That's like, is this feeder being suspended because he's already looked at the picture and come up with a solution for how to build something that would keep the squirrel out of the bird feeder, you know, mm -hmm. just a whole way. This, so this ability to perceive a lot of stuff at once and figure out how to make it work um, mm -hmm. is, uh, it's just, it's an endlessly valuable and interesting skill, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Farmer smart. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> and these guys would, and they would also, they would do that, but then they would work as a team and do it without any conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's like when you watch dancers in a chorus line and they all know how what how they're moving because they can read each other's body language. It's just an, it's another form of awareness and perception and intelligence that I just, I, I, I really greatly admire. And the irony is they would hate the the dancing analogy. <laughs> I know, I can't <laughs>